What should I be paying attention to with the news? Because it feels like watching the federal level of news now that I'm almost 40 years old, I've got my family, it feels like I'm watching WWF wrestling and that it doesn't actually have an impact on, on me in the way that I can interact with it. I mean, you know, I should probably know what's happening. But outside of that, like, I think that I want to, I want to change what news I pay attention to. I think that you, like, you know, on some acute level, you have to know what's going on, right? Like if there's, um, you know, a, a gun battle happening outside your house, you want to know that's happening. But like, I think the, the, the day-to-day comings and goings and the, you know, the various issues that come and go, um, I think you just shouldn't pay attention to 99% of that stuff and that you should just kind of stick with more long form, you know, longer digested uh, ideas, right? Where people have time to not just have the, you know, stimulus response really fast, but just, you know, recording things over time, working on theories, kind of understanding what's happening, letting ideas anneal out of the the chaos that's going on out there and build something of value and then present that back to people. Um, Annealing. That's, that's a great, that's a great concept. Can we talk about that for a little bit? When you say that word, what does that mean? Uh, In the, it's the most explicit meaning. It, it comes from chemistry and it's the process of growing uh, larger crystals in a substance um, by lowering its temperature uh, slower. So like when you're tempering steel, this is annealing, right? So you heat it up and the molecules can move around and you quench it, right? And some of them come together really tightly, right? When you, when you quench it. And what your goal is, is to kind of do this repeatedly over time and get, kind of give them a little bit more energy and then let them find a better spot to fit so that they build larger crystals of steel in there, right? And the, you know, if you just, if you just take like say a railroad tie and you hammer it out into the shape of a, of a blade by heating it up and kind of smashing it and then just let it cool, it will be brittle. Like you could smash it against a rock and it would, it would break, you know? But if you do this process of, of heating it up and quenching it and heating up and quenching it, you grow crystals throughout this thing that give it a much stronger strength and allow it to flex and be more useful. Um, and, you know, we, we kind of use this, this idea as an analogy all of the time in a lot of places. Um, one of them is like in conversations. I feel like this exactly what you're doing here, this kind of long form conversation is, a, is kind of the same process of, of annealing where we can talk about something and it doesn't have to be a, a, a two minute sound bite that you're getting out somewhere. It's like, well, I'm, I'm for, you know, sound money. It's good. Go, you know, like where you just have to not listen and just kind of be very brittle and, and, br- you know, brute force with it. Um, where we can take some time and play with the ideas and kind of say, okay, well, yeah, let's let this settle down a little bit and then come back and attack it again from a different angle and, and see what happens and not just let it, you know, flit away. I think that, uh, one of the ways that this concept of annealing, you, you had always described it to me that I like your steel and sword metaphor, but the one that clicked into my mind was lava that comes out of the top of a volcano and then hits the ocean, cools so fast that it just becomes uh, sea glass, right? It's just brittle. It's totally Obsidian. worthless. Yeah. 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 So it has no minerals in it at all, right? It has all the same, uh, you know, molecules that came out of the, that were in the lava, uh, but it's because it cooled so fast. They're all just in a big jumble. And so there's no internal structure to it. It's just glass. But if that same lava, it would be magma if it were underground, right? If it were in a, a chamber and it's just cooling slowly, like maybe over millions of years, you get something like granite out of it. And you can look at granite and kind of tell what, what their quality is based on the size of quartz crystals that are in there, right? The slower it was it cooled, it, the longer it cured, the larger those crystals are and the stronger it is. Well, and I think the, the, the real world application of this is friendship, right? Like if you have two people, they meet, you know, maybe two, maybe a, a boyfriend and a girlfriend, they meet and they have this like torrid love affair, right? If, if anything comes along and, and uh, 
you know, uh, they're not expecting. It's a very brittle relationship. They can go their separate ways. They haven't lost anything. But when you start having friendships where the people meet regularly, they see each other, they know that uh, this is not, there's no one conversation they can have that the, they, they're just no longer going to speak to one another, but they're going to keep hammering on ideas. I think you and I have done this for years and years and years and years. That's why it's actually really difficult for me to have a podcast interview with you because if we were to speak at the level that we speak when we just encounter one another, we have so much going on, so many um, threads that we can go back to that it makes it difficult for other people to jump on that train. And I, I, for me, I think one of the biggest things that's been lost in modern society is I see many men don't have these long-term friendships where they see their friends regularly over and over and over and over again. So you can take an idea and you can hammer on it and then you can go look something up and come back. And that's the dramatic difference between a relationship that you have in the, in the real world versus people that you encounter on Twitter, right? That's, that's the obsidian, you know, uh, yeah. lava flying out the top. And I think that's, I don't know, to me, that's the, one of the most important parts of my life. It's, it's like a major pillar in my life is the closeness of friends that I see regularly. I think that the thing that you're looking for here is meaning, right? Like, <clears throat> pardon me, this is what you're building, right? If you just kind of ram into people randomly, um, you, you kind of like treat them as these, you know, one dimensional characters. And, um, you know, I don't think you're capable of having a, a strong model of somebody else and what they're, what they're thinking of. But if I have lots of friends that I, or, or let's say, let's say lots, but just a few who are, who have different backgrounds from me, who have different opinions about things. And I have a good model in my head of what they would think about something, then it's possible for me to, encounter somebody and say, okay, I know what it's like to not agree with somebody. So I don't need to immediately, you know, feel attacked and, and try to crush their, their opposition. I can just try to understand what it is that they're, that they're after, you know? Well, and this gets at the core. You said something that's actually completely true for me uh, earlier about like, you grew up Catholic, you're not Catholic you don't have any problem with the with people that go to church. In fact, this year before coronavirus hit, I had committed I was going to go every Sunday. And one of the things that I began to realize by going to church every Sunday is you see the same people. Now, I didn't know those people at all. They li all live in my neighborhood because you can just drive to the local church. But now by seeing them every week, eventually you start to like wave at them. And then, you know, you you pass them on your way out. And then somebody makes a joke and I think one of the things that used to happen um, before, I, I don't know whether it was just the, the, the brokenness of religion or the acceleration of technology, but one of the things that used to happen was you would encounter people at church or at the men's club or whatever that you totally didn't agree with, but you had to see them over and over again. So you couldn't just go burn that relationship to the ground. So you had to be subjected to right. their ideas and you had to figure out like, okay, I don't totally like the fact that this person believes in deflation, but if I go and tell them that they're an idiot and they know nothing, I have to see them next week. And my wife is friends with their wife and I'm going to have all these problems. Do you think we'll ever bring that back into our society? Do you think this is lost? I don't know. I mean, maybe um, maybe we're on a trajectory to where we got to a place as far as we're going to go on the inertia that we had initially as a, as a culture here in this country, and that we're just kind of on a glide path, and it's starting to turn around now. And I think maybe when it starts to go down, people will rejoin and for various reasons some of them good some of them bad and we'll pick up a whole different set of uh of things that people will rebel against in the future right like who knows what 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 bad reasons people will have to get together in groups now there's all kinds of things that you can imagine um but i think it's going to happen one way or another because there's I, I think the illusion is gone that there's this like you know, national culture that we have that we can just kind of uh, all just keep doing what we're doing here and it's, it's all going to be fine because that doesn't seem to be the case because there's, you know, internal divisions. Um, I don't know. 
Yeah, I think there's going to be I, I, whether it's a resurgence of church is is maybe not the correct way to say this, but there is going to be a revival of people getting together on a paradigm that is not work, and it's not necessarily just enjoyment. It's not it's not just yeah. entertainment. It's going to be people coming together for some other reason, and I think part of that is going to be because the public square are people are coming to the realization that if you if the public square really is in some um like technological future where it's all done digitally it's controlled by somebody else and i think people need to have that place where they feel like they can go they can try out ideas they can say things that are a little edgy and and I think that I think religion in the past or church used to give that to him. So something is going to come up in its place. And I myself feel the pull of wanting to come to agreement with other people in my community about what values we have, about what oughts we think are worth pursuing. And I, I'm resistant to it being the church because I, I think that there's something broken about it. But I think it's coming in some way because I am willing to give up some level of my own autonomy if I can come to some agreement with other people. Can we have conversations about the virtue where I don't have to burn you to the ground uh, in order that I succeed? Yeah, I, I agree with you entirely there. And I think maybe the, the one point I would make about this is that it's highly unlikely that there'll be one thing, right? There will be interweaving different things that some people will be in three different groups that do this. Some people will be in one group, but every, there'll be many of them all across the country at different layers of the hierarchies that are out there. Um, I mean, and, and religion used to be that way, specifically in the United States, right? Like that was the unique thing about us was that we had this kind of pluralism around religion where you could pretty much do whatever you want if you weren't hurting anybody else. So all of the various, different sects and different like kind of, you know, different groups that had different ideas that were punished in their, in their countries of origin came here to practice because they knew they could get away with it. Now, in reality, every other group that came over, there was some group over here that hated them, that didn't want to let them do this and that, and that they, they, they fought these things, but eventually, you know, like we, we came to some sort of a, of a detente here and we're able to have a, a human society. Um, and like ultimately, I think wrapping this all the way back to virtues, the thing that we really want out of this, whether we realize it or not, is that the virtues give us some level of predictability for how society will interact with larger groups of people, right? That we, we won't, it's not, it's not, you know, who is currently holding the guns or has their hand on the switch as to what the laws will be, right? There's some continuity over time that again, that annealing comes back. So the longer you have that, the deeper, more, uh, you know, optimized, improved your supply chains, your entire economy can be. Now we, we realize that there's some level of balance here between perfect optimization, you know, and resilience to, to failure. Like it's not, there's not a, a perfect answer to this question, but I feel like you know, having a lot of predictability in the legal side is something you can do that allows us to, to, to focus on buffering against external shocks rather than like, oh, this group took over and they're, 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 t they're turning the dials all the way over this way for our laws. And now, now the other group came back in and they're moving them back over here.